Um, it's very much like a, sim like a you know, a seminar style. So sure. Laid back. All right. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming to, I think this is the 12th colloquium this semester. Um, and today we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Redwood Brady, um, who is the you know, chief architect behind the Idris programming language. And he'll be talking about that uh, today. Currently, um, he is a lecturer in computer science at the University of St. Andrews, where he studies type theory, dependently typed functional programming, compilers, and metaprogramming. Um, he's currently working on a new implementation of the big risk. Uh, it's just two, right? Um, Imaginatively enough, yes. <laughs> uh, and he has uh, several hobbies. He likes to play Go, I guess, and uh, walking uphill and cricket. And you do like cricket a lot, don't you? I, I think you tweeted a bunch about cricket. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I understand the about cricket, play cricket, but uh, maybe, maybe uh, now is not the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about it, so it's, it seems interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, today you're going to be telling us about dependent type driven program synthesis. So thank you a lot, Edwin, for uh, agreeing to come and give us this presentation. Okay, we're all set then. Um, thanks for thanks for having me along. Um, yeah, so uh, as as Harley says, I um, I work on uh, the Idris programming language. I, I'm I don't really. I, I did a little bit of um, uh, poking around the the Augusta University um, website. I was trying to find what what kind of expertise people in the group had. Um, so I know that uh, Harley in particular works on the Granule project. I don't really know um, to what extent people are familiar with dependently typed functional programming. So um, I am I am just going to blunder on with my talk, but. Uh, I know it's, it's um, it, it, there's a fairly a relatively small number of people in in the Zoom meeting, which means I'm hoping that interruptions will just will just work. And uh, if you, so, if you want to interrupt me, um, feel free just to interrupt me. And if that if that doesn't work, then I guess we'll try something else. So if I do if I do make some assumptions about your background that turn out um, not to be correct, then uh, you know please don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, uh, I'm going to assume, at least at the beginning, that uh, that you know a bit about functional programming, you know, a bit about uh, logic. This, this sort of thing will, will come up. Um, so, uh, what what is this talk going to be about? Well, uh, certainly I'm going to tell you about my new implementation of Idris. But the the thing uh, that I'm most interested in in working on at the minute is uh, using Idris as a um, kind of interactive program editor. So the general principle. Um, behind all this is that programming should not be should not be a fight with the machine. You often you know you often get into the situation where you've got a problem you want to solve. Um, you you start writing your program. Uh, you, you 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 write your first attempt at the program. You feed it to your compiler, and your compiler says no, because chances of you getting a program right first time uh, very low indeed. Um, and you, you know, you get increasingly frustrated. You try a few things. The, the compiler is giving you error messages, but that's all the help it's giving you. So the principle I, I want to follow is that programming should not be a fight with the machine. It should be a collaboration with the machine. Uh, so I think of it as like a conversation. So I like I will give an initial um, uh, an initial suggestion of what the program is going to be about. It's like saying to the machine, "Is my research assistant? Uh, this is the problem we're going to work on together. Uh, I'll write a partial program." the machine will guide me towards a more of a working program. So the particular aspect of that I want to talk about here is um, program synthesis. So program synthesis, um, this, this seems to be quite a trendy topic at the minute. There's a lot of people working on program synthesis in a lot of, uh, a lot of settings, so particularly with Haskell and, and Liquid Haskell. And the goal of program synthesis is to start with a type and then generate a program that satisfies that type. In the in the in the context of programming as a conversation, I don't really want to give a, a, a type up front and have the machine give me an entire program. Like, I don't want to uh, I don't want to essentially move the whole problem from writing a program to writing a type because at that point I I don't really feel like I've achieved anything. I'm just sort of um, just kind of sweeping sweeping the dust under the carpet that sort of thing. So. Um, 
I'm interested in being able to create, have the machine create fragments of programs. So if I have some particularly tricky sub problem, have the machine help me solve those sub problems. So, um, oh, another thing to say up front is I'm new at this, uh, as in I'm new at program synthesis. The, the ideas that I'm going to talk about today are things that are kind of discovered by hacking around the Idris program synthesis system and, and learned about by reading um, various introductory things on type-driven program synthesis. It's entirely possible that there are things that I don't know about that you do know about, in which case, <laughs> for me, that's half the point of giving talks, is that uh, you can tell me about things that I should know about, and it'll help make the, the, the system better. So this is very much work in progress. I've got a number of examples to work through, but there's still a uh, lot of things that I think we're, we can improve, and this is going to be what we do over the next little while. So what can it do? Why is it useful? And I'll talk a bit about how the version in Idris works. And the, the, the key thing here is it's not magic. It's just a, it's, it's an algorithm. I'm, I'm using algorithm in the, in, the, in the traditional sense rather than the new media sense of heuristic. Right, so I'm going to dive into some examples, just have you know several hundred examples here. As I say, don't forget to ask questions. Please interrupt. Please, um, uh, if, if, uh, also, what happens if type questions? I, I, I like it when people say, uh, what happens if you do such and such instead of the thing you tried? Because um, maybe, there's, maybe there's something that, um, uh, maybe there's something I haven't tried, and it'll be fun to find out together what happens. Um, oh, okay. So, um, I'll start with just introducing um, Idris program, introducing type-driven development. Um, and Idris is a dependently typed programming language. So dependent types are, um, oh, I, I prefer to say first-class types these days, uh, by analogy with first-class functions. So um, types are first-class and can be assigned to variables, can be passed to functions, can be returned from functions. Um, so they're, 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 they're no different from other um, constructs in the language, like no different from an integer. Um, so uh, we'll see a lot of that happening as we go. This, these first couple of examples don't use those, um, don't use dependent types. They just use, you know, fairly conventional uh, polymorphic types just to illustrate how things work. Um, but we'll, we'll introduce a few more dependent types as we go. Now, the general idea uh, behind type-driven development, as I said, start with the type and interactively build the program by refinement. Um, so this first example, uh, all it's doing is taking a number, uh, so nat is a natural number, zero or more, and a thing, a polymorphic thing. So in Idris, if you say, if you see um, a name starting with a lowercase letter in a type, that is a, a type level variable. So it's, it's um, intended for uh, familiarity for Haskell programmers. So, so way back when I started Idris, my, my target audience was, you know, luring Haskell pro programmers uh, over to the dependent type side. So I tried to make it uh, look a bit like Haskell. I haven't gone so far as having a double colon for types, so a single colon for types. Other than that, if, you, if you're familiar with Haskell, hopefully this is a bit familiar to you. So these, um, just having a type is fine in Idris. This is, um, this is an incomplete definition. It will compile. It will happily compile and run. Uh, it's just that if you encounter a, an undefined thing at runtime, you will get a runtime error. Uh, you'll also get a warning at compile time that your program is incomplete. But I think having incomplete programs is absolutely crucial in the modern programming language because if you have an incomplete program, that suggests that the, comp you know, if the compiler can work with incomplete programs. Um, that's a place where a compiler can help you. Okay, so I'm, uh, uh, my text editor here will talk to the Idris um, compiler. So I've got a, an Idris menu. Um, the first thing I could do is just add a clause. So if I say add clause, that takes the type and creates a candidate definition. So the, the, the simplest possible definition that would compile. Uh, the thing it's generated, it, it, so it's a function of two arguments. And this thing on the right-hand side, this is a whole. A whole, again, stands for a part of a program that hasn't been written yet. Um, and we can inspect the types of holes. So we're going to see this sort of thing. Um, uh, or we, we, we do see this sort of thing quite a bit when programming in Idris. So if you look at the type of a hole, you see the context, and you see the expected uh, return type. Um, another thing you can do. Um, I'd, I'd like this in, um, I'd like this sort of thing in Haskell. I'd, I'd like a kind of 
interactive approach to programming. And I think there's a lot of tools in development that, that, uh, that might help with this. I haven't yet found one that I'm confident enough to use um, in, a, in a class of uh, 100 students and see that it's robust enough, but I, uh, I'm hopeful that, that it won't be too long before there is such a thing. Um, and the sort of thing you might want to do is um, uh, pattern match on some input. So we'll pattern match on this NAT. And NAT is either zero or a successor. Uh, no, I haven't actually told you what this function is going to do yet, but you have maybe figured it out from, the, from just from the, the type and the, the name. What this function is intended to do is uh, make a number of repetitions of this, um, of this variable. So we're basically counting up to this number uh, and giving copies of that variable up to that number. And uh, I, I understand that you're very particular about counting in Georgia. So uh, uh, let's be very particular about counting here. So counting zero copies of, of our thing, that will give us the empty list and counting successor of K copies of our thing will give us, uh, well, we'll take a thing and then we'll make K more copies of the thing. So, so zero and successor here, that's, uh, that's our way of, of pattern matching on natural numbers. Okay, so far so good. We did that by pattern matching on the input, looking at the expected type on the right hand side, and then just using a bit of our you know, intuition and knowledge about um, how functional programming works, or how writing this sort of function works to make a definition. Thing is though, that, that all, what I just did there, that whole process of make a definition split, put a well type right hand side, it's something I do over and over and over again. And as programmers, when we do things over and over and over again, uh, well, we don't like that, do we? We, we like to abstract over um, the whole process. Or we like to you know, look, look, for, uh, look for common characteristics of definitions and abstract over them. So essentially what I did um, this summer was um, um, <laughs> abstract over myself, um, make a, a reusable implementation of myself. And instead of, instead of going through that whole process, um, I could say generate definition, so with a cursor over rep, and it will it will generate me the first candidate definition for rep, um, which is pleasingly um, it's exactly the same as the one I just wrote. So there is um, like the, the, if if you so if you want to generate a definition from a type, um, the, what what approach could you take? Well, you could you could start searching for all the programs, you could start searching for, or you, you could try to enumerate all of the well-type programs, um, which is which kind of what we do. We, we, we're, we're building the programs incrementally. We're finding um, well-typed candidates, but then the question is, why did it pick this one? Why, why didn't it pick, for example, just returning the empty list? That would be a good thing to pick because, you know, it would be well-typed. So uh, I'll talk a bit more about the mechanics of, of how this works later on. But for now, essentially, the heuristic is uh, it will um, generate a, a small batch of, of candidate definitions. So I've somewhat arbitrarily picked 16. It will, pick six, it will generate the first 16 candidate definitions. And then it will go through those and order them according to um, uses of um, local variables. So it will try to use every local variable once. That's, that's the basic idea. So in this case, it's making sure that it's, it's using this NAT and it's, it's using this uh, second argument. So the, the, the heuristic is based on the observation that if you, if you gave a function an argument, chances are that function wants to use that argument. So it will try to use that argument. Now, another thing though, is that it won't always generate the definition that we want first time. So um, this, this doesn't free you from <laughs> knowing what your program is supposed to do. So um, there's a, a sort of analogy here is, uh, you know, keep hitting it with a hammer, hit it with a hammer until you get the definition you want. So uh, I don't actually have this in the menu yet. Um, so this is a, this is a, a, a version of um, uh, the editor mode that I've hacked up myself. Um, so I can keep hitting this with a hammer and it will give me the next candidate definition. And see, it's, it's giving increasingly unlikely uh, definitions uh, as we go. But, you know, if, if the first one finds isn't what you want, you can ask for more. Now, I noticed that Harley has unmuted himself. I wonder if that means there's a question coming. Oh, uh, yeah, there was a question in the chat. I, I answered it for you. They were wondering if uh, colon colon was a built-in operator for pins. Oh, 
Right, yeah. So that they that uh, I've essentially swapped the single and the double colon. So yes, <laughs> thank you for answering in the chat. Yeah. Um, yes. Incidentally, I, mean, I guess this is worth mentioning. Uh, the reason, that, well, there's two reasons for swapping it. One is just that colon has been used to mean type for longer and by more people uh, than double colon. Um, uh, which is, I mean, that's 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 a reason. It's not a particularly great reason. Um, but the other reason is I feel that I'm going to be using more type declarations that I am uh, con uh, cons uh, constructors, which is exactly the same reason as I understand it of why Haskell has the double colon for types and single colon for cons. But there you go. Um, okay, so oh, let's let's just uh, let's, let's let's leave that one there. So yeah, it's um, generating it just by a type-based search. Uh, another example that I often use when introducing, or that, that I've um, <laughs> that I that I try to avoid using, but often end up using anyway, is um, uh, vectors. So vectors being it, it's a classic example, a fairly tired example of. Um, of, uh, of a dependent type. It's lists that are um, indexed by their length, carry the length and the type, which means if you write a function over a vector, then the properties of um, uh, uh, the properties of the function will tell you about the length properties of, uh, of you know, what happened to the vectors. Um, and one thing I've been doing with that is using it as an example of um, how dependent types help with your uh, type-driven synthesis. And the interesting thing is with this new heuristic of, of try to use all the arguments exactly once, or um, you know, as, as close as you can to once, so that, that's the ones that score highest, um, then uh, generating an append function, well, I'd say this, is, this is the append function, this is the append function you would expect. So that's the, the first one it finds by following the heuristic of trying to pattern match on everything, uh, or, or trying to use everything. Uh, I mean, I can keep hitting it with the hammer, and um, and it will it will give me again increasingly unlikely uh, implementations of append, but um, the one the one we um, the one we want is the one that comes out first. So it's it's kind of pleasing that this um, uh, this is generated. So it's correcting it. It's kind of pleasing that this heuristic um, gives us uh, a nice definition. Now, I, what I'd like to do before I go um, into how this works is just give you try to give you a feel for the sort of situations where where this is useful to us so um in general i like to use it, it, it's it's for freeing you from you know, some of the burden of, of plumbing so a lot of uh, a lot of programming a lot of functional programming particularly is, is about plumbing so uh, translating something from one type to another or or or, or um bind operators for for monads th th this sort of thing yeah um, edwin uh we have a question on youtube if you don't mind Sure, why not? Um, so Dennis is asking, uh, I'm wondering why rep, uh, whose first argument is successor of K and then second argument is X equals um, X appended to their person of call. So they're talking about the step case from rep. Um, mm -hmm. Was chosen with the given heuristic instead of uh, just calling the recursive call and not appending X to the beginning. Oh. Um, ah, that's that's a great question. Exactly once. Um, and <laughs> uh, that's because of the um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it's because it doesn't find that um, implementation quickly enough. So the order it the order it tries to find um, a result is. Look at the uh, use the constructors, um, and only if the constructors don't work, then try making a recursive call. At least at the top level. So try making a recursive call um, once you've tried all of the constructors. So if I were to generate a bigger batch of candidates, then yes, that would absolutely be the first one it picked. So um, yeah, there's there's uh, while I while I claim that. Uh, <laughs> this is an algorithm. There is no magic. There is still a certain amount of the magic numbers we pick will have some influence on the on the choices that get made. So um, I say it's an algorithm. That is, a human can explain what it does, but there are still some kind of magic constants that we've tweaked to um, to, to get some better answers. 
but yeah that that's a that's an interesting question and i should probably look a bit deeper at that and think well maybe maybe that is the first definition it should come up with um and maybe um maybe it would be better to uh, no, I, I, I've started thinking about that too much. I'll think about it after the talk, and then I'll, uh, I'll get back to the talk for now. But um, yeah, lots of reasons. Can I ask you a quick question too? Sure. So as I, I think I agree with you. Functional programming is a lot about plumbing. But there's a lot of helper function. And like, I mean, quite often you write a small function to help you write a bigger function. Right. Does your algorithm like look up, like when you try to define function number two, does it say, well, maybe I should try to look function number one that you just defined? Or do you only use built-in constructors and functionality? Right. So it's um, it might be that, that as you as you make um, uh, as you're you're building up a bigger software system, you're building up. Um, collection of hints essentially so that the, the functions that you've written are hints that you might use for uh, other functions that you're working on um, so the, the 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 internals of this system allow you to do that um, the problem with adding hints is that you're also increasing the size of the search space yeah, yeah, sure. so I think we need some kind of way of um, so some some neat way of, of asking you know search for a program but guide it using a little bit of um, additional information that, that the programmer provides. And I'm not entirely against using um, machine learning based heuristics for this, because you might, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I know anything at all about machine learning at the moment. Um, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully in a couple of months, I will pretend that I've learned, I've learned something <laughs> about machine learning. Um, but I, I sort of imagine, um, a machine being able to say, well, usually in this sort of situation, other people use this helper function. So maybe that's the one you want to try exploring. So um, I don't quite know where the, the, the body of knowledge a machine learning system would get for that, that kind of mm. uh, that kind of system. But it's, it's something I'd want to think about. But uh, yeah, we, we absolutely need to be able to, to give the machine a bit more guidance than just blunder ahead with the constructors. Um, uh, okay, I, uh, just to give a couple of examples of what I mean by plumbing. Um, um, I, I sorry, sorry. Um, can I yeah. stop you again, please? Yeah. So um, I was wondering whether those um, those menu commands that you just used uh, are also mm -hmm. available uh, in, in the REPL as, as like uh, commands? Uh, all of I... them. Not all of them, okay. So no, is no, the no, all, no, all of them are, uh, because... Um, it's uh, an implementation detail of the of the um, Vim mode is it actually works by talking to the REPL. Um, it's it's a gigantic hack. Um, so it uh, it see. talks to the REPL, pulls the response out of the REPL, and then puts it in in the editor. So so you can. Okay. Uh, this is also how t how it's tested. So the test suite does does these um, generations via the REPL. Um, but okay. that, that's important that it, that they work that way. Yeah. Okay, I, I should then ask you later for where to look them up because I don't at the moment know where they are. Um, yeah, we we should probably add something to the help that says um, if you want some help on the interactive editing commands, here's where you go. Um, so. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Thank more, you. more documentation is definitely necessary. Um, right. Um, so let's talk about parametricity. So uh, it, um, fans of parametricity know that uh, if you are suitably parametric, then, um, then there are fewer uh, implementations that can exist for your function. So I've got a few examples here that uh, we would hope that program generation would be able to find just by, you know, uncurry um, is uh, takes a function and takes a pair and applies the function to that pair. So let's, uh, let's generate uncurry. Um, I don't actually like this implementation of Uncurry it comes up with. I, I would prefer to do this uh, just as a matter of taste. I would prefer to do this by, by pattern matching on X rather than projecting out um, the first and second components. So I'm just going to hit it with the hammer again. And yeah, that's the one I want. So yeah, if you're if you're writing if you're writing definitions that are suitably parametric, it's just about uh, constructing deconstructing pairs. Um, then we would hope that it would it would happily find uh, an implementation. So everyone don't like that one either. That's, no, that's a bit better. That'll do. 
So just a few examples. Of, these are these examples, by the way, I borrowed from um, a gin, which is um, a, a tool originally written by Leonard Augustin for Haskell. So it's uh, taking advantage of parametricity to, to generate definitions that should be automatic, to be like immediate from the type. Um, let's look at one that's more um, more about dependent types. So um, I'll, I'll explain a bit about what what's going on in this uh, implementation. So it's um, it's it's a kind of program that. Um, uh, that, that you often end up writing in a dependently typed language if you're trying to use the type system to uh, explain things about your data or, or relate, um, relate to data structures. So a, a common thing to want to do in a dependently typed language is to express uh, assumptions about the relationship between two structures in the type. So this, in this case, um, I'm, um, I'm defi I've defined heterogeneous lists. So a heterogeneous list is a list where each element of the list could be a different type. In order for that to type check, we need to say that the heterogeneous, well, we need to say what the element types of the heterogeneous list is going to be. So it's indexed by a list of types. Um, so if, if the, in the cons uh, constructor here, if the first element has type T, then the index says that the first element has type T. So I, I should maybe have put an example. Um, so you'll get you'll get types looking a bit like um, uh, a bit like this, where um, I wonder if that type checks. Oh, that's not a relief. Um, so yeah, you, the 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 H list the index of the H list type says what the types of the elements are. So we can have um, uh, lists where each element of the list is a different type. So if any dynamic type language fans tell you that you can't have lists with um, with different types of each element, then uh, firstly, that's not true. And secondly, I don't entirely know uh, why you would want to do that if you weren't otherwise, if you weren't able to explain why they were also different element types. Um, the sort of place where you might use an H list is with um, uh, extensible records, uh, that kind of thing. Anyway, it's not that I want to tell you what age lists are for, but I want, to, I want to show you a thing that you often have to do with this sort of structure. Like you might have a predicate that says, um, uh, that, that extracts um, the element type at a particular position. So if you're doing some kind of lockup on an age list, you need to have a proof that the, um, the position, or that the element at position I has type, uh, has type tie in the type list ties. So the thing at position zero has type T, because we know it's the whole list, the, the index of the list is T cons T, so the first thing has type T. And if the case thing has type T, then the, uh, in, in list T's, then the K plus one thing has type T in a list that's one bigger. So if you look at this type, if, if you sort of period it the right way, You'll see that what we've done is is essentially written the lockup function already. We've um, we, we've we've exactly explained that uh, what it means to be the the thing at position zero, uh, and what it means to be a thing that's deeper in the list. It's a sort of um, prolog style encoding of a lockup function, and the fact that we've written this program once makes it kind of annoying that we have to write it again um, because just just to keep the, the type checker happy. So this is one place where I quite regularly use um, program synthesis is just like, I, I know that we, we should know what this program is supposed to look like. We've explained it in the type. So there we have it. Um, oh, so, one question in the chat, uh, Edwin is, yeah. uh, it, so one thing uh, Christopher Leak noticed was that you're using the same symbol for cons or h lists as in the built-in, is it sure. shadowing it? Um, yeah, so the um, the one you saw earlier isn't actually built in. It, it's in the library, um, but it's not. Idris is not. Um, uh, Idris isn't treating it specially, uh, or rather, the only way in which it's treating it specially is that we've got this syntactic sugar. So um, we do tend to use a lot of different listy types, list-looking types. So so I decided quite early on that it would be really useful to be able to overload constructor names. And because, um, because we, don't, we don't worry too much about preserving type inference, 
um, we give because we give types up front. That means we can disambiguate which cons we mean by uh, type checking. So obviously there's trade-offs there, and, and sometimes you know hit this. This it is possible to um, grossly misuse this kind of feature. Um, so you know please don't do that. Um, but it's it, it's it's um, it's nice to be able to say oh we, we have a listy thing so we'll just call it cons again. Um, yeah, so that yeah, that that's one of the details that I that I have a tendency to bypass if uh, um, if if people don't pull me up on it. So thank you for uh, thank you for pulling me up on that one. Um, um, one, one additional question was uh, Edward was wondering if you could maybe just quickly go through how to read the syntax of the data type definition. Yes, um, shall I do it with? Um, I wonder if I have a better one than. Uh, no, we'll just use this one. Um, uh, in fact, no, let's not use this one. Let's 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 use an even an even simpler one. Let's I'll, I'll dig one out of the um, this is one out of the library, so I, I won't be able to type check this one. Um, so if you're familiar with Haskell, um, in Haskell you would you would write a data declaration in this sort of form where you just give the constructor names. And then you give the types of the arguments to that constructor. And um, a type declaration like that in Haskell would generate um, two, two names. Uh, it would generate the name Z, which has type nat, and the name S, which has type nat arrow nat. So, um, so this, um, this syntax for declaring types, um, we, are, we are giving directly the types of each of the data constructors. So the data constructors are uh, the most primitive form that a data type can be. So uh, it's like the, the canonical uh, values of that data type. Um, let me uh, show you list as well, by because then you can relate list to um, H list. Um, so list would look a bit like this. So so nil is a list with some element, and then cons is um, some element and then the tail of the list and then that gives us a list. Um, so H list is um, uh, a list type where instead of instead of saying every element is the same type, we say that the element types are, are computed by this list of types that we give it in the type. So if, if I so nil is an H list that has well there's nothing in the H list so there's also nothing in the list of types in the index, and in cons, there is a t. There's something of type t in the h list, and then a, there's an h list with some things of type t's. So the whole thing is an h list with a thing of type t and a thing of type t's. Uh, I think the short answer to the question, though, is we give the types of the constructors explicitly. So I hope that helped. Um, right, I'd better move on to. Um, an interesting example. I mean, not, I'm, I'm hoping that they were at least a little bit interesting. Um, I was going to, I was going to show you a real example from the actual implementation of Idris too, but um, it's to some extent it's more of the same. Um, but I do want to do this example before I go on to the, before I finally go on to um, how things work, because I think this is a, this is a neat example of of a place where we're using dependent types to show the relationship between two data structures. So um, I'm doing, I, I'm here, I'm, I'm implementing a run length compression uh, on lists. So run length compression is where you have um, some number of copies of one thing and then some other number of copies of another thing. So if you have, if you have data, if you have a list data where there's lots of runs of things, uh, this can work pretty well. Uh, so I think it originated in a, in a paint program in, in MS-DOS in the 1980s, um, if, I, if I remember correctly, uh, where you often get runs of the same pixel color. So the first thing we need to do, so let's do, we, we, the, the, the representation of run length encoded data, what I want to do is explain in the type that my run length encoded data is, uh, is representing some, some other bigger list. And, and we'll, we'll use that bigger list to ensure that um, the representation is sound. We'll also use it, it turns out, to help us write a bit of the, the program. Um, so an empty run length encoded list, well, that's the run length encoding of the empty list. Um, if we have uh, a number and a thing and a run length encoded rest of the list, then 
that will give us a representation of a list which is n repetitions of x and then the rest of the list. So this plus plus is the cat operator. Uh, by the way, th there's nothing to stop. I, I, I chose to do this as um, uh, just a sound representation rather than necessarily the most um, precise. So this is, uh, uh, there's, there's nothing to stop this number being zero, which would be a very bad run length compression. Um, but let's, let's not worry too much about that for the sake of this, uh, this example. Um, right, so this, so when we, when we represent some run length encoded data, so this, this test compressed data, it's uh, three X's followed by four Y's. I, I've put a question mark here for the, the, the type of this, just to show that there's a bit of type inference uh, happens. And um, just occurs to me that uh, I run through my examples before I give talks every time, and I, and I didn't test this one. So, so I wonder if this, I wonder what this is actually going to do. Um, oh, that's a relief. Um, so it's, um, oh, it, it's, it's, it's not completely evaluated it though. That's a, that's a, that's a bug in the display. Uh, but you'll see in the type that it's, um, it's the run length encoding of, of three X's plus four Y's. And it, it, it should have evaluated this, but it didn't. Never mind. Um, right. Uh, oh, we do need to generate rep. Let's uh, let's have rep back. Now, um, I'm just going to concentrate on on compress because um, compression is a little bit fiddly uh, and kind of out of the scope of this talk. But you'll notice in the type of uh, run length compression, so it's 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 indexed by a list of things. Uh, the type kind of says what we need to do to uncompress the list because the index of this type is the original uncompressed thing. And it sort of suggests that, well, if, uh, if, I've, got a, if I've got an empty list, um, then the, the, the uncompression is the empty list. If I've got run, then the uncompression is n copies of x and then the rest of it. Um, if I try saying, so I'm just going to initially, for my implement for, for uncompress, I'm going to say that, uh, well, I'm uncompressing this list, uh, this run length encoded list of x's, and I'm returning a list. So just for the first implementation, let, let's see what that comes up with. Um, so I'll let you, while I take a sip of uh, orange juice, I'll, I'll let you peer at that. Um, uh, so hopefully you see that, that this isn't quite what we want because, well, N hasn't been used. It didn't know that the search didn't know like there's there's no hint that says you need to be using rep. And so there's no there's no real way it can guess that I need n copies of x. We've got an n here, but there's no way to guess that it uh, uh, the reasonable way to guess that it needs n copies of x. And uh, worst of all, I haven't really said anything in the type. Th this type doesn't say anything about the relationship between the list I'm returning and the list that's coming in. So somehow I want to ex I want to say that the thing we're returning is this list x's. I, I want to be explicit about that. Now, one thing I could do, you might, you might think at first, well, x's is available. Let's, so let's, let's add a candidate definition and let's just try returning x's. Let's just, just blunder on and say, x's was the uncompressed list. We've got it in scope. Surely that's okay. Um, but unfortunately, it, it's not going to let us do that. It says X's is not accessible in this context. So this is a new thing in, in Idris 2 that uh, we have, um, we have uh, quantities in types that allow you to say whether something is around at runtime or not. Um, so in this, in this uncompressed function, we do have X's as something that's in scope. Um, so it is at compile time. We know that this is a run length encoding of the list X's. Um, but, and this is, a, this is a good thing, we don't have X's available immediately at runtime. If we did, we wouldn't actually have achieved anything by compressing the list, you know, it would, because uh, we'd be carrying around the original list as well as the compressed version of the list. So the fact that this is a zero is a good thing. What we need to do though, is uh, explain to the machine that we want to construct a list and when we finished constructing the list, that will be the list that, uh, that we knew about at compile time, only we constructed at runtime. Now, if you've been looking at the code, uh, there is a hint. There is this singleton type. So a singleton type is a way of saying um, the, the type has exactly one inhabitant. So the thing we're going to return is um, 
a type, um, a, a singleton type whose only inhabitant is the list X's. X's, or the, 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 the thing carried by a singleton, if you look at the type of vowel, um, there's no quantity annotation on X. So that means it's unrestricted. So this other compress function, it's going to take our run length encoded version of X's, where X's is only known at compile time. It's going to build a singleton representation of X's where X's is built at runtime. And we're going to have a compile time guarantee that those two things match up. And because we've already written this, we've, we've kind of written the uncompressed function already just by having this, this uh, run length encoded uh, data structure with it in the type. So if I try to generate that, that's what we get. So it's uh, so the empty list in this case. And the tricky thing it has to do is um, this singleton needs to be unpacked. So we need to pull out the value and then we need to pack it up again uh, when we get the result. But other than that, uh, unpacking and packing it up again, we can, we can pretty much generate it by looking at the indices here. So it's another case, um, and this, this sort of thing comes up over and over again in dependently typed programming. Um, and you know, there's possibly more things we should do about it. But if you've written, if you've explained a program in one place, you shouldn't have to write the program again in another place. And it's nice to have um, even relatively simple um, type-driven synthesis tools to, to avoid having to, having to redo the work. Um, so um, any questions on that one? Uh, I know I'm not really paying attention to questions. Okay, I'll, I'll take that as a no. Um, um, I, I, just, I just found my unmute button. Um, oh, right, <laughs> go ahead. So uh, I kind of wonder why are you able to use a function which is rep in the type yes. declaration of nice. run? Um, Oh right! So this is this is a question not not about the synthesis, but about uh, the type system in the first place. Is that right? It, yeah, because it, it makes sense that you can synthesize the program from the type because the type actually has a program statement in it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it it when you put it like that, it's like well, well done. Of course, you can do that. Which is, to be honest, um, it's it's the response I wanted. Uh, but yeah, the question is how. Uh, what, what does it even mean to have a function in a type? So this is, uh, this is an example uh, of what I mean by first class types. So uh, you, can, um, you can put um, functions, if, if, it, if a type is indexed by some data that is a value, so this run length type, it, it's indexed by some list. List is, a, list is a value. You compute lists with functions. It's just like the ordinary list that you would see when you compile and run the program. So the fact that um, the thing that's expected here is a list means that we can use any of the list functions. So there's, um, uh, so in Idris, because there's first class types, there is no ceremony involved in uh, running a function at, a, at the type level. So you don't, you don't need to do a special type level version of a function. You just put it in the type. So you know, people people talk about type level programming. I just call it programming. Um, I think to go a bit deeper than that might involve a bit too much of a digression. But does that at least give you a suggestion of? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that helps. Um, yeah. Type says um, first class objects. That that kind of helps because I'm used to programming in languages where types are different from programs. So right. you can't run um, a function on a type. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's as you'd expect. I mean, that's, that's the normal way of doing it. So, I'm, I'm, um, so um, out of curiosity, any Haskell or Scala? No, I, I'm a systems programmer. So oh, right, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. I'm just I, trying to find I'm, I'm trying to find an example that might match up. But I'm, right, no, I, I, I mostly write C++, which has a ooh. very flexible type system, but there's right. a distinction between type level functions and program data level functions. But C++ is a great example, because C++ does have type level programming. It has like um, all sorts of exciting things you can do with templates. And I believe that the type that, 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 that that's part of the system is Turing complete. Is that right? It is. Yes. the The C plus plus type system is is uh, and the template system is Turing complete. Right. Um. So you can actually write your entire program at compile time if you want to. 
but you still have to use the compile time versions of all functions. You can't write a function like rep right. that could either accept a type or an integer. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, so you you will actually be able to do all of this sort of thing in C++. It would just be a lot more involved because you have two different languages. So um, probably the thing to the thing to take away from this is that Idris is um, so noticing that that people love that sort of thing in C++. It's really cool. Um, you can do all sorts of clever things, but it's a lot harder work than I think it needs to be. So one of the things we're trying to achieve with Idris is making the kind of trickery you do with C++ templates, just something that's that's natural in the language. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, no, it, it, that's, and it's true. You, you spend a lot of time in C++ sort of writing two versions of a function, the, the right. template one for the for at compile time and the runtime function for data. You know, there's, uh, yes, absolutely. There's, there's the template edition and there's regular edition and there's template, you know, list cons and there's regular list operations right and and in fact I, i'm i'm, I'm gonna um give that as the takeaway for this talk is um uh first class types make doing all of these fancy things just natural like you, we we don't have to you, you don't have to say oh this is a bit hard it's just the thing that you do in the language so, uh, so i'd really like to to encourage people to to try that sort of thing uh, out a bit more, rather than trying to do fancy things and shoehorning them into type systems where it doesn't really work. Give it a try in address and, and, and see if it works out. Um, right, just conscious of time, I think I should probably do a quick summary of how, I, I do have several hundred more examples, but uh, you don't want to sit and listen to me do that all day. Um, I will instead um, do a, a little bit of an overview uh, of how this works. And um, uh, I may be given a, a little bit of a hint as to how things work already, but um, just to make it a bit more precise. Um, I do want to be clear that, that there is no magic. And like, sometimes I give these talks and, you know, I, I look at, uh, you know, mentions on Twitter or whatever afterwards, and people are saying things like, whoa, that's magical. And it's really not magical. It's, um, in fact, one criticism I've had of this, this approach to programming is, oh, it's just a conjuring trick. And... Um, that kind of is just a conjuring trick. There's 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 a there's a very uh, there's a little secret underneath, like all the good magic tricks um, or conjuring tricks. Um, there's a little secret underneath that makes everything work out. So I want to give away what that is. Um, if you know what the secret is as well, you can use it better. It's just a um, my um, my uh, my advisor James McKinnon when I was starting my PhD and I was I was really struggling to do um, kind of interactive proofs that sort of thing sort of the, the fundamentals of type theory. He would, he would implore me to be the machine. He would say, you know, try to understand the mechanics of what's going on inside the machine, and then you will understand the process of programming it. So I'm, I'm, what I'm saying here is learn to be the machine. So the essential idea is it's a type-driven search. We don't generate all of the possible programs and then see which type checks. We build programs incrementally. So I showed you holes. Uh, and I showed you case splitting. So the machinery that the, the, the program search is using is that machinery. It is exactly that machinery that's used for interactive editing uh, by anyone else. So one, one thing that we're trying to do really is, is come up with a, a semantics for what the interactive editing process is. So what are the primitive actions so that you can start writing combinators, functional style combinators that, um, that, that, that glue those actions together and you can write your own um, you can write your own proof search mechanism. So actually what I want to do is this thing that is implemented as part of the Idris system, I would like to be able to implement it as a, um, a kind of a reflection mechanism. So, so, it's, so, it's, so that I, I would like the program search to not even be implemented in, Idris, um, in the Idris core. I'd like it to be something that's implementable as a library, which I think is achievable. Anyway, um, essentially it's type-driven search, build programs incrementally, um, it, it doesn't stop when it finds the first result. It will, it will give you a result and how to continue the search. Um, so it'll take a batch of results and then by some heuristic, it will then order them. So um, if you have um, some primitive features in your, in your language core, then you can probably just implement this with, uh, with not too much work. You know, hesitate to say that something is a, a small matter of programming because you know that <laughs> there are details there's a bit of a draw the rest of the owl involved here 
Um, but there are some primitive, the, the primitive operations you need are holes for saying, you know, partial search results are incomplete. So we need to, uh, we need to generate partial results and then explore inside the hole. Um, unification, because when we're checking, uh, when we're testing a constructor against a type, we will unify the type of the constructor with the expected type, and that will give us a bit more of the solution. So that will um, uh, that will solve a bit more of our program, and it will cut down the search space. And then case splitting. This is for um, if you if you find that a, a search hasn't achieved anything, maybe splitting one of the inputs, maybe a, a pattern match on one of the inputs will work. So having case splitting as part of your system uh, could potentially help there. And um, uh, yeah, we don't need these details. Um, in fact, no. What I'll do, I'll, I'll run through. I'll run through an example. Um, that's maybe a good way to finish. Because if I run through an example, then uh, you'll 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 see the outline absolutely in action. So, um, oh, I did I did I did say that uh, Vect was the tired example, and uh, try as I might, I, I couldn't come up with one that uh, uh, <laughs> that that. I mean, tired as it is. Um, it's really useful because it has it has some nice characteristics. It's very simple. So so vect, if you haven't seen them before, they are lists that are indexed by the length. So nil is a vect um, with um, zero elements, and cons is a vect with successor of something elements. So it's nice. It's a nice example for for, um, for program search because it it cuts down the search space. So this search hole. Um, if we look at the context of this hole, uh, we've got a few things available. We've got uh, uh, we've got our X, which has type A. We've got our X's, which is K things long. We've got Y's, which is M things long. And we're trying to make something which is um, uh, successor of something long. So the successor thing is crucial here. So um, the uh, show the outline of the algorithm. It's um, try a few things in order. So try the local variables. If it's a function type, refine it with a lambda. If it's a data type, go through the constructors, see which ones unify. If nothing else works, try making a recursive call. But when you make the recursive call, make sure you're getting closer to the base case. So in this case, the only thing that's going to have any hope of working is a cons. Um, so if, if we go through, um, like none of, none of the argument, none of the things in scope fit the type. Uh, cons does fit the type. Cons has type, uh, the return type is, um, Effect of some successor of something. So the next step is we have a cons, and there are two sub holes. There are two two arguments to cons. Um, so we just work through the arguments. So what is um, so a one has type a. We have a local variable of type a. So we'll just pick it. Uh, a two. Um, well, we we don't have any any local variables that work. Neither nil or cons immediately work. So zero doesn't unify with k plus m. Successor doesn't unify with k plus m. We need to know we need to know more to be able to do that. So the only thing that will even allow us to make progress here is to make a recursive call. Um, so we'll do that. Uh, making a recursive call. So we check for we 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 build the recursive call, and it's only after that that we check that it's a descending recursive call. Um, so now a three that's generated two cases. So a three that just works. We've got we've got immediately we've got an x's. A four. Um, oh, that's supposed to be a, that's supposed to be an M. Sorry. Uh, A four. We've immediately got a Y's. There's no more holes. We're done. So it is literally doing exactly what I do when I'm writing these programs. It's just doing it uh, a little bit more incrementally. Now, um, oh, I noticed that I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to say that program search is. Um, it's expression search plus you do a case split if it didn't work. So if expression does search doesn't work, do a case split, try an expression search on everything that you've generated up to a reasonable maximum depth. Um, uh, this is my second last slide, if I remember rightly. Um, so this happens inside a search monad. The search monad gives us the result that we found. It also gives us a continuation that says, what to do if the current search is considered unacceptable. So unacceptable would be either, um, well, it didn't work, there was an error, or it might be the user has hit it with a hammer. So I'll, I'll, I'll give me the next result hammer. So a user can always ask for the next result. 
Um, the heuristic I uh, suggested, which um, that's a very interesting question about rep, that, uh, that uh, you know, why doesn't it find a different rep first, which I'm, I'm going to investigate uh, probably on Monday now because it's, it's Friday evening where I am. Um, but it's certainly something I'm going to investigate. But the, this heuristic of ordering by the most local variables turns out to be a really nice heuristic. And a lot of the time gives us the definition that we actually wanted. Uh, three, fine, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, really ought to mention related work. As I said earlier, a lot of people are working on this sort of thing. I've just picked a couple of examples. For all I know, there are people in the audience who are, who are working on these systems, uh, in which case I'd love to talk to you. Maybe not now, but uh, in, in, when, we, when we can find the time, I'd love to talk to people who know more about how, how synthesis works for uh, other kinds of type systems and see if there are ideas that we can uh, share. Right, I will stop there because I see I've, I see we're at um, two p.m. Uh, in in Georgia. Uh, the 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 way I like to finish is just to say that uh, if you have the right primitives in your language, so if you have if you have the holes, if you have the case splitting primitive, and if you have um, unification, um, turns out that program searches is, is surprisingly simple to implement. Uh, I'm always very wary of this word "simple," but um, you know, having having implemented the machinery, it was the work of like two or three days to to, to glue it all together because it, it was a matter of um, taking taking the the primitives, the right combinators, and um, seeing what came out. So it was very pleasing to see things like uh, rep coming out, things like append coming out. A couple of examples I didn't show you was a, a call CC, so I can find call CC just by by uh, the program search was very pleasing because I, I don't believe I could ever write call CC on my own. I, um, so I'd be, be lying if I was if I claimed I could understand call CC. Um, lots of possible lines of work. Domain specific synthesis. I'm uh, something I'm looking at is uh, uh, communication protocols, session types for communication protocols, um, and being able to say to the machine. And this actually came up earlier when talking about hints. It would be nice to be able to say to the machine. Do some program synthesis, but use this fragment of the search space. So, give me the next action in a protocol, for example. Give me, um, give, give me the next operation on that channel. Um, so, thing, things that are immediate from the type, but you have to tell the machine which thing, which particular search algorithm to use. And um, I mentioned machine learning because someone always asks, "Can machine learning help?" And I was like, "I don't actually know the answer. I, I need to learn. I need to know more about machine learning." Again, maybe one of you uh, knows more about that, and that's something we could explore. Anyway, um, that seems like a good time for me to stop. Um, thank you very much for listening, and thank you for the interesting questions. It's um, it's very refreshing to have an audience that is that is interacting. It's it's, it's rather hard in this environment that we're currently working in, so I have to thank you for uh, for being a, a very interactive audience. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, it was a great talk. I'm uh, happy to see. These cool examples, especially the, uh, I thought the run length encoding was really cool uh, example. One thing yeah, I want to know um, is uh, uh, Dominic, Dominic and his student Jack have recently Jack uh, published a paper about uh, uh, synthesis in granule using, using uh, 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 making uh, use uh, of the types. So I know you have I some have uh, uh, or quantitative uh, types in Idris uh, too. Uh, mm -hmm. This might be something that, that you might capitalize on as well. So that, that's an interesting question. So I knew that they were working on that, and, and I, I didn't know that there was a paper yet. So um, do you know where that was published? Yeah, it, it was in Lobster 2020. You can go to the granule uh, research page. Right, I will, I, I will take a look. Um, yeah, no, I, I knew that, I knew that, um, that Dominic and, um, and uh, I've forgotten, I've forgotten the yeah, student's exactly. name, sorry. Exactly. Jack, yeah. Uh, so I knew they were working on it. Um, uh, but I didn't know how far they got. Um, yeah. But a really interesting point about quantities. So um, what I used to use as an example of synthesis was um, take the append function and say in the type that we want to use these two arguments. So I would I would show generating append, and then it would generate append with the empty list. It would just say it's the empty list. Right. Yeah. And then I tried this heuristic, and suddenly I didn't have an example anymore <laughs> that showed the value of the quantities. So um, I don't currently have an example where quantities uh, matter. So yeah. I definitely have to look at, uh, at, at Jack and Dominic's paper 
because yeah, they have a number of examples. maybe they have some. Yeah. Um, and yeah, granules really cool because the, the 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 quantities in granule they 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 express a lot more than the quantities uh, in Idris. But um, it's sort of in some ways it's it's more expressive in the in the. Um, uh, the resource uh, in talking about resources, maybe right. slightly less expressive in the kinds of things that you can put in types. So something that combined the powers of granule and Idris, that would be uh, that, that would be our plan to take over the world, I believe. Well, I, I have two papers for you, so. Fantastic. Does anyone else have any uh, last minute questions before we adjourn? Oh, it looks like there's a few questions on, uh on the YouTube, if you don't mind. Yeah, let's go for it. I, I, I'm happy to sit here for a little bit longer. Um, so Dennis uh, asked, uh, singleton X's is a good example of structural bounded type comparing to uh, taking the subset of a list. Uh, okay. Similar to finite uh, sets comparing, it's hard to kind of read it, honestly. <laughs> Um, There's a lot of code there, so. Yeah, I don't, oh, so I don't. the question is, so they, they've rephrased it here. So uh, the question is, any ideas whether synthesis will work for non-structural types? Um, so what would be an example of a non-structural type? Would it be like that, that sort of thing of um, saying, uh, a list plus an ordering proof or something like right. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's what it is. I don't know. Um, I've thought about it a tiny bit because um, something I'd like to be able to do, I mean, this isn't, this isn't quite answering the question, um, but it is related to something I want to be able to do, which is, I mean, proofs are programs in my world. So um, we have proofs of properties of functions and sometimes those proofs are structural things. So it could be that if you're generating, like, so if it's a list and the predicate, then the list part is structural, but the predicate is is kind of constraining what the list could be. So so it becomes a um, still structural but quite complicated problem. Um, and this might be this might be a, a thing where we need to we need to give a few more hints to the to the proof search machinery. Um, so you, if you can come up with some way of encoding appropriate hints, then maybe you have half a chance. Um, mm. I, I don't, I don't immediately know if it would work well. Um, uh, and it, I'm, I'm wondering if it's also, uh, it reminds me of another thing that, that's potentially interesting, which is, uh, not only type driven synthesis, but example driven synthesis. Where you could maybe use an example to constrain the search space if you find an answer, but um, um, but one of the example inputs you've given at some point um, isn't going to work, then could also be a way of constraining the search space. So yeah, if you have if you have something that isn't structural, maybe it's a way of constraining the search space, but I don't immediately know how to build it into the uh, the, the algorithm we've got. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Christopher League is saying in the chat that they found it interesting that in the append base case, it correctly used the local variable, but in the rep base case, it ignores the variable. <laughs> yeah, um, hang on, where, where is that one? Um, so, oh, no, that one, I, I, was, I was curious about that one, because if, if I keep, um, I'll probably have to start again, because it'll have forgotten the state. Um, I wonder how long we have to go before it does that. Because um, I did wonder about this. Uh, I felt that it, that, oops. It, it chose the empty program there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that meant it, because I pressed the button, it forgot the state. Um, I, I think it might be that that uh, implementation isn't in the initial batch of 16. Oh, there's, there's, oh, ah. Oh, I've got it. This this interface is not slick. <laughs> um, it's kind of and, like and, uh, when you try to do Unicode in Agda and you accidentally hit the wrong key. Yeah, uh, I just noticed that it came up with the. It, it eventually got to the um, 
the one that uh, that just makes the recursive call. Um, yeah, so uh, that that's the one that it used to generate first. Um, it's in some interesting orderings that it's picked. Yeah, um, but uh, there, uh, there it is. Uh, did it come up? No, well, that, that's that's the one that, that we might expect first. Uh, I don't think we've seen one using um, using X in the base case yet. I think. But if is, I understand correctly, um, there's no connection between the two parameters, right? It's not choosing or no. between the return and the zero, right? It's not because there's a natural base case that we're generating an empty list or something like that. Yeah, well, mm, I, I think it might just be that um, the, the order that it's exploring things is that uh, anything interesting in the base case just comes up too late in, in the uh, search order. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 like it's, it's explored that bit of the base case, and then now it's exploring more of the uh, recursive case, and it's going to have to finish exploring the recursive case. Oh, here we are. It's, it's st it's, it started doing something interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Going I mean, in the wrong yeah. direction. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 my guess would be this is to do with the size of batches that it's generating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, once you move from algorithm into heuristic, then, you know, good luck. Thank mm. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, also, it's it, also a function of the way the Vim mode works. Is um, uh, it, it has to do the whole explore? Like, there's no state between the editor and Vim, uh, oh. which is a bit of a pain. So, so it actually has to do. When, when I ask for the next definition, so it generates one and shows me the first, then it generates two and shows me the second. So, uh, the 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 editor protocol is is cleverer than that, but the Vim mode is not. So. Um, also worth noting that the, the short pause you see between generating definitions, um, that's almost entirely because it has to start up the scheme runtime system. <laughs> so every time it has to restart Idris, Idris compiles via scheme. There's about a 0 0.3 second startup cost. Uh, so, so the search itself is actually quite quick. And this, this little pause is just Shea scheme spinning up. And, and so uh, every time you 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 have to call out to Idris, it's basically a new process every time it restarts. Yeah. yeah, this is this is only in the Vim mode. Other editors are a bit more sophisticated than this. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm sure people notice that little pause, but I, I feel like I should at least explain the little pause. I mean, yeah, so I'm completely I, out of fault. Time to do the search personally. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Cool. Um. Yeah, and in practice, in terms of how long the search takes, uh, I, I, I need to put a timeout in. But I've generally found that if it doesn't find an answer within a second, it's never going to find an answer. Oh, ah, interesting. Um, but then, you know, I, I kind of stopped working on this when semester started. So I'll, I'll get back to it and explore these things. More. I know. Oh, that's it. Uh, when I mean, I'm sure we all have the same. I have <laughs> same uh, one more if you have another minute. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you've thought about integrating this with some small unit testing or quick check type of thing so that you can eliminate candidates that don't pass tests in addition to the types? Yeah, um, I think we should do that. Um, I don't quite know how it would work, um, as, in, well, as in what the notation would be, but maybe a way of giving examples, mm -hmm. which are, uh, and, and those examples could be either Quick check style properties, or they could they could simply be example inputs and outputs of the sort you would see in unit tests. Um, the, then we'd have to think about how um, how do we integrate with that that with the search so that we so that we prune the search early. So I don't want to I don't want to generate a complete definition and then check it against the example because then we haven't necessarily saved anything. Um, right, right. So we should be able to do that because. Um, uh, it's a necessary feature of a dependently typed language is is partial evaluation. So we can uh, we could partially evaluate our uh, we could take our our partial definition, partially evaluate it against an example, and it might be that you encounter um, you encounter an error really early. So I think that could that could probably work. Um, uh, before I do anything there, I really need to look at what other people have done with example-driven program synthesis because there's, there's, there's quite a bit of work on that. Um, 
but the more information we can give it, the better. Um, yeah. It's a question of how well it fits into the workflow of this time-driven um, development, but sometimes, sometimes giving examples will be the right thing to do, I'm sure. Mm. Cool. Oh, thanks again, Edwin. This was really great. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, for me, it is now very much beer o'clock, so I'm going straight to the fridge when yeah. I close down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, th this was recorded and will be posted on YouTube. I'll post it on Twitter. If anybody wants uh, the link, they can just go back to the same talk uh, website, and it'll be on there. Bye, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Okay, thank you. Right. Good night. Everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Yeah. I usually wait till everyone leaves. And we'll just have a quick skim of the chat <laughs> before I go. Yeah, sure. See if, see if I missed anything. I think, I think you, pretty much, you pretty much said all of that. Yeah. Great. Right, I'll be off. Yeah, thanks a lot. Cheerio, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you a couple of papers on graded dependent prices. Oh yes, right, absolutely. That would be that would be great because I'm I'm sure there's stuff that I've <laughs> while I while I've been in my teaching JavaScript uh, yeah. um, uh, whole. I'm sure there's interesting things that have been happening that I've missed, so, so I'd love to hear about them. Yeah, Stephanie Warwick and I have, uh, and Richard Eisenberg, first one of Stephanie's students, got a pop-up paper, and then uh, me and Dom, our paper, which I think you've you've heard about before, is getting yeah. at ESOP, but it's on archives. Like this. Oh, Popple, that's awesome! Congratulations on that. Yeah, thanks. My first, my first ever one. So I'm pretty. Excited. Yeah, well, I've. I've uh... I'm very good at getting rejected by Popple. Yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> Who isn't? Yeah. I like getting rejected all the time. So I was like, finally it'll win. And in 2020, yeah. no, that made my year a little better. I love, yeah, absolutely. Right. Cool. Thank you again. Cheers. Cheers.